Hello, and welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm the producer and also occasional host, Caroline Roberts. Today, we'll start the show off with a conversation on what socialism really looks like in Denmark, a country routinely cited as a good example of how collective policies have worked. Reverend Ben Johnson, senior editor here at Acton, joins me to break down the policies in Denmark and their real effects. After that, on the second segment, Alan R. Crippen, who's the chief of exhibits, programs, and public engagement for the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center in Philadelphia, joins us to discuss the life and work of William Penn. There have been different narratives about the creation of America's liberty that have obscured Penn's role in history, a man Thomas Jefferson referred to as the greatest lawgiver the world has produced. In this segment, Alan Crippen sheds more light on William Penn's real contribution to America. To learn more about the subject, you can also hear Alan Crippen talk about the legacy of William Penn at our upcoming lunch and lecture event here at Acton on March 21. And you can save your seat at acton.org slash events. Lastly, if you like this show, please don't forget to swing over to iTunes and leave a review and rating. In a recent appearance on 60 Minutes, Anderson Cooper asked 29-year-old Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez about her supposed radical ideas or her far-left leaning ideas. Cooper said to her, when people hear the word socialism, they think the Soviet Union, Cuba, or Venezuela. Is this what you have in mind? And she responded, of course not. What we have in mind and what my policies most closely resemble is what we see in the UK, Norway, Finland, and Sweden. Ocasio-Cortez seems to be increasingly gaining traction in Washington, even with the recent release of her Green New Deal. We won't be talking about Ocasio-Cortez for much more in this segment because I want to focus on another topic that spins off of her model. What does socialism really look like in Nordic countries, specifically Denmark? To help me break down the subject, Reverend Ben Johnson, a senior editor here at Acton, joins me today. Father Ben, thank you for joining Acton Line. Thank you so much for having me on. In an article that you wrote last month for Acton's Religion and Liberty Transatlantic publication, you drew attention to a new study released by a free market think tank in Denmark. And the name of this think tank is the Center for Political Studies. Um, The study is about 20 pages long. And basically the goal of the study, and correct me if I'm wrong, was to address how the U.S. perceives socialism. And this was in response to the White House's Council of Economic Advisors report, and it was called the Opportunity Costs of Socialism, which included a section of how socialism looks in Nordic countries, including Denmark. Is this correct? That's exactly right. So fair warning to our listeners, we're going to get into a little bit of he said, she said when it comes to the two reports. The first thing that this study from Denmark does is basically pat us on the back saying the Council of Economic Advisors was right in a point it made in this report, saying that you can't characterize the Nordic countries and Denmark as socialist because in a socialist country, the state owns the means of production. For so long, a lot of people have thought of Denmark as being a perfect example of almost, quote, soft socialism. If they're not socialist, if Denmark isn't a socialist country, what is it? That's a good question. And you're right. Uh, People have looked at uh, what they call the Nordic model of socialism or Nordic socialism. And uh, so uh, you mentioned Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Bernie Sanders has used this term and many other democratic socialists in the United States point to those nations as examples of what they'd like to implement in the United States, so they say. But uh, their policies in some ways actually go beyond what's there. In some ways, they're not quite as extreme as what uh, happens there. Uh, Essentially, what you have in Denmark and the Nordic countries Uh, ironically, is a quite free market in some ways. Uh, Denmark actually ranks ahead of the United States in the uh, Heritage Foundation's uh, list of economic freedom. Uh, They're about six points ahead of us. So they have less regulation on the front end of the economy. It's much easier to start a business in some of these areas than it is in the United States. There are fewer forms to fill out, uh, fewer regulations, uh, fewer Uh, For for example, there is no minimum wage in some of these countries uh, that's set by the government. So there's less regulation on the front side, and uh, they have much freer trade with other countries, particularly uh, in the last few years. But uh, as they're part of uh, the European Union, it's possible to load up a truck full of goods in Gdansk and drive it all the way to Spain and not pay any tariffs or tolls anywhere in between. So they have an incredibly free market on that side. Where there's a difference is... 
after the wealth is generated, then there's a lot of redistribution. And that's, that's essentially the, the difference there. Uh, when we talk to American politicians, they, they wish to regulate both sides of it. And Denmark tried this. The, the Nordic countries did try this, and it did not work out very well at all. So people have thought of Denmark basically as being socialist because of the expansive welfare state? Exactly. The, the social uh, welfare state, uh, what Pope John Paul II called the social assistance state in uh, Santissimus Anus, his 1991 encyclical that dealt with the matter. When you're looking at um, those, those nations, they have a, a great deal of uh, government programs, government benefits, and uh, many of them are not means tested. They're, they're for absolutely everyone. Uh, so there are there are child child credits, child care, uh, almost literally cradle to grave. And uh, at one time they were incredibly robust. And uh, so in the 1970s, the 60s and 70s in particular, their welfare state expanded just as ours did in the United States. Theirs was ahead of ours to begin with and and uh, exceeded ours significantly. But by the mid 1970s, Denmark was at a point where um, some of the uh, leaders of the nation actually called their economy calamitous. So they, they realized they were on the brink of um, of implosion in many cases. They had unbelievably high interest rates. And so beginning in the uh, 1980s, the early 1980s, a series of governments, both left and right governments in Denmark, started liberalizing the economy. Uh, the top corporate uh, tax rate was cut by half uh, to down from 50 percent to 22 percent. Uh, the top marginal tax rate was in the 70s. At that point, it was actually 73 percent. Uh, they cut that by uh, more than 20 percent as well, uh, or about 20 percent. So uh, it was it was a significant rollback of uh, the front end of the economy. There's still a great deal of redistribution, but even that got scaled back, particularly in Sweden. At one time, everyone who retired got the exact same check. Uh, not not simply the same percentage, but the same dollar amount. And so they changed it more to the way that uh, things work in the United States with Social Security, where you get uh, a certain check based on what you paid in in your years of work. Uh, that's that's not necessarily free market, but it's more free market than what they did. And that, that helped free up the system so that uh, the economy could still generate enough revenue that they could redistribute it. But given that, you say, and so do other studies like the study from the Heritage Foundation, that Denmark has one of the most free economies. Yes. And, uh, you know, not not merely Denmark, but uh, many of these Nordic countries have very free economies. Uh, again, when it comes to business formation, for example, or um, those sorts of government regulations, uh, Johan Norberg of uh, the Cato Institute, he's he's with Cato, but uh, he lives in Stockholm. He had a PBS special that came out uh, just a few months ago called Sweden Lessons for America. The entire thing is available online for free. And a uh, matter of fact, uh, I blogged about it at Acton.org so they can come to our website and find uh, the entire hour long documentary that he did for PBS. But he shows just how easy it is to start a business, how easy it is to experiment with new products, uh, the safety regulations in terms of new experimentations. Uh, don't go through the sort of uh, levels of, of um, uh, regulation that OSHA does, for example, in the United States. It's much easier in that sense uh, to start an economy, so uh, to, to start a business, and all of that uh, benefits their economy. So. It's it's easy to think of them as a socialist country because of what they were in the popular imagination in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and uh, we've just never caught up to the reality of what's happened once the welfare state began to cast its shadow over everyone and they had to chip away at, uh, at the benefits that everyone got so that uh, the economy didn't come screeching to a halt. So regardless of the economic freedom, though, you still note that in your piece, they're suffering quite a bit economically. They do still have, again, a, a very robust welfare state, far more than what we have here. Uh, it is it is virtually cradle to grave. And uh, the Council of Economic Advisors put out a report saying that uh, the U.S. economy, if we had uh, implemented the economy that uh, they had in the 1970s, our GDP would be about 80 percent of what it is now. Uh, we would be missing almost uh, one in every five dollars in your pocket would disappear magically overnight. And uh, the the, Dan the Danish report that you mentioned, uh, from uh, which is available at uh, cepos.dk, uh, said, actually, if anything, you're underestimating it. You, know, you would be even poorer if you did everything that we had done. Uh, and uh, the OECD has found that uh, tax cuts, if you cut taxes by about 10%, it generates about 1% GDP per year. If you think of compounding interest, 1% a year, year on year, when you're talking about billions upon billions of dollars, is a lot of money over time. So tax cuts uh, help help a, a great deal. 
uh, regulation, cutting regulation helps a great deal. But there, when, when, you're, when you're dealing with the redistribution of wealth, everyone in the middle of, um, of the Danish economy is poorer than every American. It's only at the very bottom, the, the bottom 10% of Danish citizens do make a little bit more money. They have, they have about $5,000 a year more than the average poor American in the very bottom. But everyone else is poor. When you get to the middle, uh, they have about 75% of the, uh, the amount of money that the average middle class American does. And I don't know anyone in the middle class who thinks he has enough. I'm going to play a bit of a devil's advocate here um, and say that regardless of higher taxes, it sounds like they're getting what they need, right? It's at least as touted by a lot of supporters of democratic socialists here that there's less economic inequality in Denmark. So what's wrong with that? Right. So income inequality uh, is is uh, an issue that's uh, talked about a great deal in the United States. It, it's worked its way into um, into our political lexicon for, for uh, many uh, political cycles now. Really, the, the question is uh, not so much inequality as it is total amount. And that's what people, I think, don't look at. The one politician who did was Margaret Thatcher. Uh, when she was prime minister during a, a very famous exchange uh, during uh, uh, her time as, uh, I believe, was at, at prime minister's questions, she was having an exchange with a member of the Labor Party and Uh, They talked about how income inequality had grown while she was there. She said, yes, but everyone is doing better. Everyone is making more money. Those at the bottom are making more money. Those at the top are making more money. And and she said, you would rather that the poor were poorer uh, instead of having the rich richer. So what's really important is is not the overall level of economic uh, inequality. Uh, There are African nations where almost everyone is equally poor. That's that's a, an offense against human dignity uh, in in the fact that there is such grating poverty around the world. Thankfully, there there are people in the United States who are trying to bring enterprise and uh, and to try to bring economic activity there so they can support themselves. But ultimately, uh, what's what's important is the overall level of the economy and the Fraser uh, the Fraser Institute, which is a Canadian institute measures this as well. They find that it's it's literally true of the old phrase that we heard growing up, the poorest people in the United States are richer than some of the richest people in other countries. Do you think that socialists today, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Bernie Sanders, do you think that they really want the sort of policies that we see in Denmark? I mean, how are these things not obvious the way that Denmark is in pain as a result of higher taxes and what you say is a, quote, cradle to grave welfare program? In your opinion, do they just turn a blind eye? Well, in part, it hasn't been uh, reported very well, which is why uh, the Danish think tank that you're mentioning and Johan Norberg, and uh, there's a, there have been a series of books by a, a, an Iranian emigre who uh, went from Tehran to a Sweden named uh, Nima Sanandaji. Uh, he wrote a book called Debunking Utopia, but he wrote a few others as well. Uh, all of these are trying to tell Americans – a, we are not socialist in the in the denotative sense of the term. The government doesn't own the means of production. But second of all, to the extent that we increased the welfare state beyond a certain point, we did suffer for it. And so there's been this sort of a cottage industry trying to bring these two truths to Americans before we make the same mistakes that they did. Uh, in large part, really, it, it, we talked a little bit about the fact that these are not socialist countries, but we should emphasize the other fact, which is in some cases, what uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Bernie Sanders or others are talking about, they, they tend to minimize the pain of the programs that they uh, are advancing. So, for example, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez says there's a 70 percent tax rate uh, in some of these countries. Uh, Sweden, uh, according to uh, one estimate that I saw, has a 70 percent tax rate. But it kicks in at about ninety thousand dollars, not seventy million or ten million. Uh, Denmark once had a seventy-three percent top tax rate. Now the top marginal tax rate in Denmark is fifty-six percent, but it begins at eighty-six thousand or about eighty thousand dollars. Eighty thousand dollars isn't impoverished, but it's not well to do. That's a lot of money to squeeze. On top of that, then everyone in Europe pays a value-added tax or a VAT tax, which is about uh, it's like a national sales tax, but it's about twenty-five percent. So you have consumption taxes, which hit the poor the most because they have the least amount to spend on consumption. So it costs them the most, harms them the most. Uh, They are the hardest hit. When you add in uh, the VAT tax and other taxes, then there there are taxes on coffee. Can you imagine if we had taxes on coffee in the United States? You'd be rioting in the streets, uh, particularly on my street at any rate. Uh, There there are taxes if you want to own a car. There's a $1,200 annual tax that you have to pay the government for the privilege of owning a car. 
And it's renewed every single year, like a, a real estate tax. You have to pay that flat rate year on year, regardless of the value of your vehicle, by the way. Your vehicle might not be worth 1200 but you might have to pay 1200 in taxes. So all of these things, obviously, they, they harm the poor the most. Uh, but the average person, the, the person who's in the middle, middle you know, the median income in Denmark, the average Dane pays more than half his income in taxes to the government, about 55% all in all. So uh, we, we shouldn't minimize too much the, the pain that would be in store. There simply isn't enough honey in the hive to squeeze it and be able to get all the money that you need for an expansive welfare state beyond what's being implemented anywhere in the world from millionaires and billionaires. Ultimately, the middle class is going to pay the bill. How do you think practically we're going to be able to realize this? Because, you know, it seems like so many people I talk to, especially a lot of people in my generation who believe that they're tired of capitalism. I mean, I think most of the time when they say that, they really mean cronyism. Um, but when they say that they exemplified Denmark and other Nordic countries as, you know, pretty much prime utopian environments good examples of how we could structure our economic system. How do you suggest we point out the realities of it? Well, I, I would take one particular stratagem, I think, which is that in many of the cases, the people who are uh, talking about uh, these nations as examples of what we should do here also believe in diversity. I believe in diversity. I believe it's very important. Uh, they do as well. And uh, so you, you begin with that common ground and you say, okay, all of these nations until very recently, they are small, homogenous countries. They're, none of them uh, is a large country. None of them uh, happen to be diverse in any way. And they prize their, homo their uh, homogenous cultures. Now, there's a law in Denmark which uh, was passed over this past summer in 2018. When, whenever you accept a government handout, then government regulation inevitably follows. One of the uh, things, and by the way, it's something that's advocated here in the United States. Barack Obama spoke about it in, uh, I think, every uh, State of the Union address that he gave in the second half of his, his uh, presidency, is that they have child care, which is paid for by the government, open to all. The Danish government decided it wanted to help children, and uh, they've had a, a fairly large influx of Syrian and uh, Middle Eastern refugees. They decided that the way that they wanted to make sure that they maintain their homogenous culture was if you were in, and forgive me, this is the term that they use in Denmark, if someone is labeled, and this is a quote from, from the Danish government, a ghetto child, which has a specific definition, which is that uh, they're in a, an area of persistent poverty and high immigration, that child will be separated from his parents. We had a political discussion about separating children and parents not that long ago in the United States. That child will be separated from their parents for 25 hours a week and get taken to government education beginning at the age of one. At one year old, the baby will be separated from their parents and uh, taught Danish culture. Part of that, by the way, includes the importance of the celebration of Christmas and Easter. I'm all in favor of that, but many of these people are not Christian. They have different religious holidays, different religious beliefs. Now, should the government be taking babies who can't speak and communicate away and teaching them a religion that in some cases conflicts, or at least a culture that conflicts with those of their parents? I think when you put it in those kinds of stark terms, uh, then people begin to see that when you concentrate all the economic power in the hands of the government – you also concentrate all the regulatory powers in the hands of the government, then even something as, as soft and seemingly benign as, as cultural integration can turn into uh, a child crying 25 hours a week. Father Ben, thank you so much for shedding some light on this, both for me and for our listeners. Oh, and before I let you go, where can our listeners look for this article and other articles like it? Well, uh, there are two places. The uh, first one is blog.acton.org, which is uh, all of our writers who contribute uh, uh, some very high-level articles. But also then uh, I edit the Transatlantic website, which is acton.org slash publication slash transatlantic. If that's too much to remember, just go, go to acton.org and uh, look for our Transatlantic publication there. Acton University is not your typical conference. It's a four-day celebration with 1,000 of your newest liberty-loving friends from all over the world. Each day is packed with thought-provoking presentations on the foundations of a free society. Expand your worldview and explore theology, business, market-based economics, and much more at the most unique conference in the liberty movement. 
To apply, visit university.acton.org. Welcome. Uh, my name is Dan Huger, Librarian and Research Associate at the Acton Institute. Today my guest is Alan Crippen, the Chief of Exhibits, Programs, and Public Engagement for the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center at the American Bible Society on Independence Mall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Alan and I will be discussing the life and legacy of William Penn, the subject of his upcoming lecture, William Penn and the American Experiment of Liberty, which will be given here at the Acton Institute in Grand Rapids, Michigan at noon on March 21st, 2019. The lecture will also be live streamed for those of you who cannot join us in person. Alan, welcome to Acton Line, and thank you for speaking with us. Well, thank you, Dan. It's uh, great to be with you today. So a lot of people know, you know, have vague recollections of William Penn from high school history classes. They might think that he's the guy on the Quaker Oats tin, but otherwise, you know, the name is doesn't mean a lot to them, especially for those of us uh, not from the state of Pennsylvania. Could you give us a little background on exactly who William Penn was? I certainly can, and, and I can say definitively that he's, he's not the iconic figure on the Quaker Oats uh, cereal box. <laughs> a lot of people think that he is, uh, but that's uh, not the case. Uh, William Penn, he dates in the 17th century, which was a, a really tumultuous century in, in English history. Uh, your listeners may recall that that was the time of the English Civil War. So Penn is born in that century. He's born in 1644. He dies in 1718. So he he grows up in uh, what historians have called the, the biblical century. Everybody read the Bible. And and of course, he's, he's working through uh, a number of issues regarding that time. This was um, a time when the, the English monarchy uh, was abolished, that the Puritans were experimenting with a, uh, a republic. It was a, a failed experiment, but experimenting with a republic. It was a time when uh, the English people were, were trying to grapple with religious dissent. They weren't doing it very well. So Penn uh, comes of age in this. He is the son of an English admiral, Admiral Sir William Penn. Uh, and by the way, a lot of people think Pennsylvania is named for William Penn. It's not. It's named for his father, Admiral Sir William Penn. So he's he's from a, a family of privilege. He's uh, of a of a lower order uh, English uh, gentry, and and because he's from privilege, like young English men of privilege, they attend one of two institutions, Oxford or Cambridge. He goes to Oxford. At Oxford, he comes under the influence of the great Puritan. Uh, divine John Owen. John Owen is the vice chancellor of Oxford in these years, and and he's being basically ushered out because the monarchy has now uh, been restored. Cromwell has died. The, the English Republic is at an end. Charles II is on the throne again, and he's cleaning house. So so Penn is, is caught up in that. But while he was at Oxford, he had contact with John Owen, was very much uh, impressed by uh, John Owen's ideas about religious toleration and dissent. It's it's also an interesting fact that at the same time Penn was at Oxford, John Locke was a tutor at Oxford. Oh, nice. It's not a big place. Yeah. So so I, I think we want to connect the dots with, with all of these um, people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so uh, anyway, Penn ends up leaving uh, Oxford. He goes to France. He studies under uh, Moses Amiro. And again, Amiro is a very uh, famous uh, French Huguenot thoughtful on on religious toleration and so on and so forth. So these are these are Penn's early uh, intellectual influences. Uh heads back to England, his father sends him to Ireland to sort of take care of the the family estate there and uh he hears a, a Quaker preacher and is uh, swayed by this preacher's command of the Bible and his vision for a more pure, uh, I think what moderns would call a more New Testament type of Christianity. This is, you know, pretty common in the era. And so Penn, uh, to the chagrin of his parents and the society in which he was raised, becomes a Quaker. How does how does Penn's religion sort of as a dissenter, as, you know, the with with the Restoration monarchy 
coming back into power. And then with that experience with dissenters in general, and then as a Quaker in particular, how does that sort of shape his, his thinking in life? Well, again, this is a, it's a really uh, complicated uh, century in, in history. And in England, though it's, it, though it's wrestling with religious dissent, it's, it's not sort of figured out a way forward. So when Penn <clears throat> returns from Ireland back to England, he, of course, r- readily and soon on affiliates with the Quakers, and he ends up being arrested. Of course, there's a complete embarrassment to his father, uh, who's a prominent war hero and a friend of the royals. He, Penn is a good catch for the Quakers because he, because of his uh, sort of uh, the, the fame of his father, his status as an English gentleman, he gives the Quaker movement uh, some credibility. It, it, it was a movement that was largely situated in, in the lower classes. And so now they have a, uh, an advocate, a spokesman of privilege. And when, it, when William Penn is arrested, this is, <clears throat> this is big news. This is uh, public news. So one of those early arrests is in 1670. Um, he's arrested for, for basically meeting illegally with Quakers. Uh, this is the situation they only uh, lawful worship is worship in the Church of England, the Anglican Church, and the Quakers are are meeting obviously outside of that context. So it's an illegal meeting. He's arrested for it. He spends some time in in jail, and while he's in jail, he's uh, reflecting on on the injustice of this uh, treatment. He's obviously reflecting on his own conversion experience to Quakerism and and that training he had at Oxford and in um, some more in France. Uh, so he writes, he also had some legal training, he writes uh, what's called the Great Case for Liberty of Conscience. And uh, arguably, this is his most important work on religious liberty. It's a work that he keeps coming back to. But it, but it appears in 1670, and it's a, it's a theological and a biblical and a, and a philosophical uh, and practical argument for liberty of conscience and for religious freedom and practice. Penn is sort of unique because not only is he seriously thinking through these theological and political issues, but at some point comes to be able to, to shape an actual polity in, uh, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. How does Penn come to, well, you mentioned earlier that it's named after his father, actually. How does, how does Penn himself, uh, William Penn, come into uh, possession of Pennsylvania? Yeah. Well, uh, he's, he's of course in and out of jail through this through the 1670s, and his his vision, right, is for a more just uh, English society. His his argument is that uh, the, the crown, the government, can have uh, religious freedom as well as political stability, order, and loyalty. And and he's making this case, and he's not he's not really gaining traction. Uh, shortly after he wrote the great case, his father died, and he became the heir to his father's uh, fortune and holdings. Uh, his father was owed a great debt, uh, the equivalent, I guess, of sixteen thousand pounds sterling by the British Crown. And so Penn had dabbled a little bit at American colonization. He he was involved with the colonization of West Jersey. Mm-hmm. Is this Penn Penn Senior? No, Penn. I'm sorry, Penn Penn Junior. Yeah, Penn Junior. Young Penn. Young Young Penn. And that was that was a that was a Quaker mm-hmm. experiment that he was involved with. That wasn't central to it. So so he had been involved in the in the founding of of West Jersey, but but he he basically sees the possibility to demonstrate afar that religious liberty, freedom of conscience freedom of worship are not incompatible, uh, again, with British law and, 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 and British, British liberty, and British order. He realizes that the crown owes his father this money, and he, uh, he applies for a land grant in the New World. And that land grant, uh, you know, 16,000 pounds apparently can get you quite a sizable piece of land. Yeah, <laughs> nice little size. <laughs> so, so the crown grants him a tract of land, which we now know is uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, he was issued that charter in 1681, and a condition of that charter would be that he would name it for his father. Penn was somewhat embarrassed to have his name on the colony, uh, and he was he was also embarrassed that people might think 
it was named for him, but it was a it was a, a royal stipulation that it be named for his father, and he he made the best of it. So, what what role did Penn then have in shaping the political organization of the colony? He get, he gets the land grant. There's a limited purview in a sense because you know this is still a crown colony, but. But what sort of influence um, does he have in shaping the political polity that would become that would become the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? It's it's a great question. I, I think, uh, and this is something that um, I think very few people appreciate that Penn is is both a um, political theorist, right, in terms of of his um, Bible animated uh, understanding of religious liberty and principles of government. But he's also a political practitioner. So, so the condition of the grant, it's, it's, it's not technically a royal colony uh, with an appointed royal governor. It's a, it's a proprietary colony. So it's a colony that is uh, literally owned by William Penn. Okay, yeah. Um, he's, he is, I guess we would call him a real estate developer. So he has this large tract of land to develop. And of course, part of the charter is that he's got to govern that that uh, colony in accordance with and in congruity with the laws of England and, and the crown and, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so he uh, now has an opportunity to, to create what he called early on a holy experiment. And of course, the capital city for that is uh, Philadelphia. He, he names that city uh, from, from the Bible, right? Philadelphia meaning brotherly love. His, his opportunity in his view is to, to create a a society, a, a, a model government that is based on religious freedom and brotherly love, and he's really animated by these by these ideals. When you read his uh, the introduction to his um, frame of government in 1682, which is basically the Pennsylvania's first constitution, which he drafted, uh, he had some. Counsel in drafting it. Algernon Sidney, for example, gave him some counsel in drafting that, and we've already alluded to potential contact with John Locke, although we don't, you know, we don't really know how much contact he actually had. But but so so he's, he's he's writing this in the in the midst of this time, and when you read the introduction to the frame of government, it's really an expositional sermon on key scripture texts about. Uh, you know the the why and the where and the hows of uh, of government. It's it's quite fascinating. What sort what sort of legacy does this sort of? I mean, this is a legacy that extends beyond Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania itself, being being one of the American colonies, shapes and contributes to the American founding. In in what ways do you think do, do you see that most clearly? Well, I I think it's uh, <clears throat> most clearly seen in the the American ideal of religious liberty. And this this is really at the heart and center of uh, William Penn, William Penn's um, vision and experience as a religious dissident in England, his uh, hope to demonstrate that uh, religious liberty is compatible with British law, and his sort of Quaker commitments to to democratic ideals. So here is uh, the proprietor of Pennsylvania, this this grandee, uh, an aristocrat who creates in the Pennsylvania frame of government, the Pennsylvania Constitution, what is arguably the most um, liberal and democratic polity in the world at the time. That's, that's Pennsylvania. His last constitution for Pennsylvania was the 1701 Charter of Privileges. And in, in that charter, uh, religious liberty is, uh, is made an irrevocable right of Pennsylvanians. So this is an amazing, lasting legacy. Pennsylvania was one of the later colonies, right? I mean, the the earliest colony is Jamestown, 1607. Uh, Of course, we all know the Pilgrim story of the Pilgrim's Landing at Plymouth Rock in Cape Cod in 1620. Pennsylvania is is not chartered until 1681. Penn doesn't arrive in the colony until 1682, and 1682 is the founding year of its capital city of Philadelphia. And yet within a couple generations, Philadelphia becomes the largest English-speaking city in the New World. Uh, it, it, it becomes the freest, uh, arguably the freest uh, uh, 
tolerating not simply Protestant sects, but Catholics are free to worship there, which is almost unheard of in the British colonies. Jewish believers are free to worship there. So it was an amazing experiment in religious pluralism. The Liberty Bell, of course, is cast uh, in, in 1751 to commemorate the Jubilee, the 50th year anniversary of the 1701 Charter of Privileges. And, you know, it has that famous Bible verse from Leviticus inscribed on it. This is the context for William Penn's experiment. And, of course, Philadelphia becomes the uh, de facto capital of the, the American colonies in their, in their uh, resistance and later rebellion against England. And I think um, Philadelphia is also the locus of the Constitutional Convention. So, so as these delegates to the convention are wrestling with an ideal new government, and as that ratification process goes through and it becomes apparent that we need a Bill of Rights to, to, to make this uh, ratification real, and I, I don't think it's accidental that this, this, this debate happened in, in Philadelphia in this um, very successful experiment in religious liberty. Uh, is is Philadelphia for for our listeners who aren't familiar? Uh, could you could you share uh, that that verse from Leviticus that's there on the uh, on the Liberty Bell? Yeah, on the on the Liberty Liberty Bell, the the verse inscribed is from Leviticus uh, chapter mm-hmm. twenty five, verse uh, ten, and it says, "Proclaim liberty throughout all the land and to all the inhabitants thereof." Yeah. That's a wonderful wonderful theological grounding for a for a political order. It, it certainly is. Does Penn have a religious legacy in America outside of Quakerism? You know, he certainly has a, a, a robust political legacy. Right. But is there is there a, is there a continuing sort of um, religious resonance? I, you know, I, I, that's a really interesting question. And of course, of course, Quakerism, right? Um, yeah. American Quakerism, English Quakerism, they um, revere and honor, and rightly so, of William Penn. And I, I think maybe this is why one of the reasons Penn is less appreciated because I, I think um, particularly for mainline, more traditional uh, Christian people, the, the 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 Quaker question is somewhat problematic in terms of appreciating Penn. They sort of, sort of Penn is relegated to Quakerism, with sort of which is this a small sect of Christianity. We're not sure what to make of it. We're not sure how orthodox it is, and and thus you know Penn's. Uh, religious writings are not taken as seriously as they should be. His classic religious text is No Cross, No Crown, you know, a, a beautiful uh, exposition about the way of Christ. So I would say that, you know, certainly the, the evangelical Quakers today, uh, that this would be the Quakers that are uh, represented by, you know, great personalities like Elton Trueblood and and uh, George Fox University, that these believers would be would, would rightly stand in that that religious legacy of of William Penn. But I think I think we'd we would all be greatly enriched yeah. by a greater knowledge and a better understanding of William Penn. What lessons do you think? Um, and these can be religious, these can be political, these can be broader than that. Um, what sort of lessons does William Penn have for us today? Well, I think, you know, today you don't have to Google too far to find, you know, the controversy surrounding uh, religious liberty. So I I think, again, revisiting these very basic American principles, principles that were seeded uh, in many ways by William Penn, in the hope that he would be, you know, he said, uh, you know, my hope is that Pennsylvania would become the seat of a nation. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I think, indeed, that that hope uh, was, was actualized. So yeah. revisiting these uh, fundamental co- commitments, these um, these articulated principles in in the found in his founding documents, those, the, yes. the documentary record of uh, of Pennsylvania, uh, I think would be uh, inspiring. I think you know Penn also uh, in his own way was grappling with pluralism. Now pluralism is 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 uh, it's a problem. Uh, and a challenge mm-hmm. in the um, 17th century. Uh, it's a different kind of challenge than it is in, in the 21st century. But I, but I think there are principles that may be helpful. For instance, Penn had had in his mind put limits on pluralism. Right, it, that to be a citizen of the colony, 
you had to believe in God. Right? Yeah. So there, so there had to be some kind of transcendent, some sort of bedrock moral, theism. That, yeah. yeah, bedrock. Yeah. So, so that was his, I guess, limit mm-hmm. to pluralism. You know, these are these are things I think to for for moderns to wrestle with, think about. You know, how how might this apply to our own context? What what does this say? He also was very concerned and and saw a a role of a role for the state in 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 guiding and instructing morality, mm-hmm. right? Which seems to be uh, becoming more and more passe in, in our in our own times, um, and yet. Yeah. Penn did see a, a a morally regulative role for the state. I mean, was he right? Was he wrong? But I, you know, I, I think that's worth thinking about. No, I think that yeah, combining that commitment to pluralism with a sort of deep moral grounding, I think, is a great uh, great synthesis to strive for. Alan, thank you for being with us uh, here on Act and Line. We look forward to having you uh, here to discuss this more in your upcoming lecture, uh, William Penn and the American American Experiment of Liberty. On March 21st, uh, for those of you in Grand, Ra- Grand Rapids, please attend. For those of you elsewhere, that will be live streamed as well. So, yeah, thank you again, Alan. Thank you, Dan. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I look forward to being with you on the 21st. Thank you for listening today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We're always trying to make a great show for you. And one of the ways in which we can do that is to use feedback from you. We would love to hear from you. Whether you'd like to suggest a specific guest or topic, let us know what you like or dislike in our shows, or just generally let us know why you like listening. You can shoot us an email at actinline at actin.org. In addition to that, we're trying to create a new occasional segment for the show. If you have any questions related to a subject we've covered on this podcast before, or questions related to economics, faith, business, or maybe a current issue you'd like to hear discussed on the podcast, leave us a message at 888-705-4180. If your question is picked, you'll get to hear it on the show, and members of our team here at the Acton Institute will break it down on the podcast. Last but definitely not least, if you like Act In Line, please subscribe today. And don't forget to share it with your friends or family members who might also enjoy listening to this podcast. We're available on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. This episode is produced by me, Caroline Roberts, with audio mixing by Doug Nagel.